And the fist bump was supposed to suggest this kind of, we got over on them, didn't we? Right? This was the secret world of Michelle and Barack. And this was July 2011, four months before the actual election. So this hysteria haunted Obama. Right? And if you, he gets, of course, he wins the 2008 election. And then two years after the election, and of course, you think about it, he's been elected, he's been vetted, so to speak. Through the you know, supposed democratic process, he's been vetted. But in August 2010, I talk about this in the book, in August 2010, a Pew poll comes out. Pew poll did you all these national polls and whatnot. And in August 2010, this Pew poll finds out again, almost two years after his election, that 61% of Americans believe that Obama is a Muslim or that he might be. Now, I didn't say 61% of the Tea Party. Or 61% of the Republican Party. 61% of you, based on how sample sizes go, not that Davis is indicative of America um, in any way, but 61% of Americans thought that he was or might be a Muslim in 2010. Right? And for me, as I talk about in the book, this was indicative of a larger national anxiety over the legacy of Malcolm X, the history of blackness and Islam together. This fear of what Malcolm X ushered in and the politics that he tried to put forth surrounding kind of black communities in this country. This fear of the connection between blackness and Muslim that has been haunting Obama is in many ways a deeper anxiety over Malcolm himself. Right? And so I, and I talk about this at the beginning of the book, and, and for those of you who think that, well, okay, you're just a scholar and you're making these really crazy connections right now. Is this really real? I mean, scholars tend to like pull things out. And scientists have a way of throwing a formula in and making it seem like it's science. And they put in a formula and they talk about, you know, standard deviations and probabilities and likelihoods and they have all statistical language to make it sound like it's probable or possible or plausible. In the humanities, we just kind of do it, right? And while some of you might be a little skeptical of that connection, again, I take you back to Obama's election himself in 2008, 2009, right? Not the election. He was inaugurated, the day of his inauguration, which was done on which was done on, of course, Martin Luther King Jr.'s holiday. It was done in 2013, the inauguration was also planned, right? But in 2012, when he was elected, it was done the same day as the holiday in the National Mall on Washington. More people, bless you, more people gathering in the National Mall on Washington than even before the original March on Washington, right? And in that speech, Dianne Feinstein, great senator of California, is introducing Obama on the days. She's about to introduce Obama. And this is how she introduces him. Now again, think about the kind of political theater that's happening right here. We're on the march on. This is Washington Monument, same exact place where King made his famous I have a dream speech. This is on King's birthday, the national holiday. This is the first black president being elected or inaugurated. He's already been elected. This is January 2013. Feinstein says, quote, those who doubt the supremacy of the ballot over the bullet can never diminish the power engendered by nonviolent struggles for justice and equality like the one that made this day possible. Right? She said that generations would, quote, look back and remember that this was the moment that the dream that once echoed across history from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial finally reached the walls of the White House. How many people caught that? Those who doubt the supremacy of the ballot over the bullet can never diminish the power engendered by nonviolent struggles that made this day possible. Obviously, you, re you recognize the references to Dr. King, nonviolent struggle, the dream, the struggles, 
But there was also a very direct reference to Malcolm X in his speech, The Ballad or the Bullet. His most, arguably his most iconic speech. His most iconic speech in which he argues the futility of black participation in the U.S. democratic system based on how it's presently constructed. Futility. Yet, in fact, Malcolm says, to vote as a black person in America is to be a traitor to your race. Explicitly, Malcolm says this. And he says that instead, black people need to take on other means. He's talking about third world liberation struggles that black people need to connect themselves to. We'll talk about that. But I mention the Feinstein introduction to Obama himself to suggest to you all that Malcolm X is still doing tremendous work and is in fact haunting the highest levels of U.S. statecraft. They recognize and understand the centrality that Malcolm's thinking has, and has had and continues to have on black political culture. And so it's important for us to understand that Malcolm is still laboring for us, not just some crazy lefty scholar talking about Malcolm in a book. Not grassroots activist communities who are doing work using Malcolm's template as a way of thinking about how to articulate a particular politics. Thank you, my brother. But Malcolm is also operating at the highest levels of U.S. statecraft in terms of his centrality to define a particular black politics against, who not to be. And we'll talk about what that is. So it's important for us to understand the centrality of civil rights, logic, the celebration of multiculturalism today, and how the figure of the Muslim, Islam, Muslims, are seen as a threat to all of this. So the question becomes then, several questions. What role in place do Muslims have in the United States or the larger West? This is a question that, for example, non-Muslims are asking of Muslims and in secret of themselves. We were at lunch talking today and somebody brought up a statistic that in the state of Texas, seven out of ten people were recently polled and said that Muslims should wear some form of identification. Now, some people might say, oh, that's Texas. We can begin to obviously think about after Boston and the kind of, you know, what Trevor Aronson called the terror factory that's been put in place. We can begin to think about the fear that's being, that's constructed around this figure of the Muslim. And while these questions are being asked by Muslims, sorry, of Muslims by non-Muslims, those questions are also happening within Muslim communities themselves. How do we define ourselves? Who are we? And we can talk about some of the pitfalls of those positions that Muslims are embracing and taking on. But one way of maybe beginning to think about answering the question, whether it be from non-Muslims or from Muslims themselves, I think is to look again at the history and legacy of Malcolm X. Right? I think he provides a particular way of thinking about how Muslims can animate a particular kind of politics. And so, in the book, I open up with chapter one talking about, bless you, I open up talking about Malcolm X and the way in which he imagined black communities in the United States not as a national minority, but as part of a global majority. He, he, Malcolm would say, if you want to understand what's happening in Mississippi, you have to understand what's happening in the Congo. If you want to understand what's happening in Detroit, you have to understand what's happening in Cairo. Malcolm saw white supremacy as a global phenomenon, not just domestic to the United States, right? As a global phenomenon. And it animated a particular kind of politics for Malcolm. But as I talk about in the book, it wasn't, Malcolm didn't cast a long shadow over black political culture after that. So many people were influenced by him. So very briefly, I go on in the book talking about the importance of Malcolm to the formation of the Black Panther Party and the black power struggles. And how, for example, they found common cause with the third world. 
In fact, Eldridge Cleaver, Huey Newton, Angela Davis, Kathleen Cleaver, they talked about how black people were part of the third world. We don't see ourselves as part of this U.S. nation state. Right? And of course, the book is concerned with how black radicalism connected itself to what I call the Muslim third world. Right? So I talk about how Malcolm was using the struggles in Cairo, in Palestine, in Algeria. And the Black Panthers opened their first international office in Algeria. Huey Newton writes a letter of support in 1972 to Palestinians. I talk about the struggle, the anti-colonial struggles of Iraq in the late 50s on shaping the black radical imagination. And then I go on talking about post-black power in the war on drugs, war on crime rhetoric that in many ways was just counterinsurgency against black social movements. After black power, right? That's essentially what it was. The rise of the prison. Hip-hop emerges out of this context, and so does the figure of Malcolm. And I talk about how hip-hop in the late 80s, early 90s, and all the way up until today, has embraced different kind of Islamic identities and articulated themselves in particular ways. For those of you who don't know, even today, Lupe Fiasco, I'm sure, Yasin Bey, you know, we can talk about a whole host of artists, uh, you know, Freeway and Beanie Siegel today, but in the past, hip-hop's golden age was replete with artists who identified with Islam or Muslim in one way or another. And I talked about that in the book. And so I continue to talk about that how in the 1990s, too, through Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations thesis, the West versus Islam. Muhammad Ali becomes this figure that kind of is this redemptive, almost reconciling figure, right? And then the post 9-11 kind of scare around black Muslims and prisoners. I talk about these connections, right, in the book as a way of frame, of, a way of thinking about how and in what ways did black communities think about themselves globally, right? And so, you know, I want to, I, I, I give you guys that brief overview, somewhat brief of the book, to give you a sense of kind of the scope of the different debates that I'm tapping into. But if we want to return to a figure like Malcolm X and really get into why he's significant and relevant, right? We, all to, we have to then return to that question of civil rights. And very briefly, what is civil rights? Where did it come from? Again, we all take it for granted today. Civil rights is oh, it's what made America better. It's what freed black people. This is the narrative. Right? It's, what, what, it's what makes Obama president and what gives us multiculturalism. But where, well, where did it emerge out of? What were the conditions that in these claims for integration and assimilation, where did they come out of? And it's important to understand this particular moment, so bear with me for like five minutes. This is where Malcolm emerges, right out of it. And I talk about this in the book. After World War II, and it's important for you to think about this, I mean, for communities of color, but particularly, I want you know, young Muslims to begin to think about these questions. Right after World War II, a vibrant black left emerged in the United States. What do I mean by a black left? They were tying their struggles for justice and equality in this country, Jim Crow, segregation, lynching, a whole host of forms of racial violence. They were tying those white supremacist forms of violence to the anti-colonial struggles that were taking place in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, also what we now call the Middle East, West Asia. They understood that the third world was also colonized through the logic of white supremacy. And so we need to create connections between black communities here and the third world if we're going to undo this thing called white supremacy. Vibrant black left emerged. A whole host of actors, I talk about this in the book, a. Philip Randolph, National Congress on Negro Women, NAACP, was a leftist organization. They talked about, they spoke out in support of the Palestinians. They spoke out in support of the Congolese. They spoke out in support of a whole host of third world liberation struggles. But by 1947, by the late 40s, the Cold War was declared. I talk about this in the book. Why is the Cold War relevant? I know it sounds like a long time ago, but again, follow me. Truman Doctrine in 1947 declares communism the biggest threat to the security of 
the United States and its allies. Anti-communism becomes the dominant framework for thinking about U.S. statecraft. It's going to justify U.S. intervention abroad, anywhere where a potential communist comes up. The U.S. is authorized to go in and squelch it. Sound like preemptive war? Sound like anti-terrorism today? Right. Domestically, I'll, I'll get to the domestic picture in a second. On the foreign policy side, the argument was, right, and this is, becomes really important for thinking about Malcolm, the argument was that to the United States, as far as the United States logic was concerned, but Europe was decimated by World War II. Hitler had run roughshod over the rest of Western Europe. Hitler really just wanted what England and France had. It was a battle over European powers. Hitler just wanted. Both of them were master race philosophers. Western Europe, England, and France, they were Western, they were master, they were Nazis just like Hitler, just with a different name. Amos Cesar and a whole bunch of third world intellectuals point this to contradiction out. You're no better than Hitler. You're just mad now that Hitler's doing to you what you've been doing to us. But Europe is decimated. And so the United States wants to assume global leadership. And the United States then, based on this Truman doctrine of anti-communism, assumes that communism is a bigger threat to the third world than colonialism. Communism is a bigger threat to the third world than colonialism. What that meant was the United States was going to underwrite and maintain colonial relations with the third world. Better to have them under the yoke of colonialism than to get free, create a vacuum of power where the British or the French or the Europeans weren't there anymore and the communists can come in and take over. So instead of giving them or allowing them or having their freedom be achieved and face the possibility of communism coming in, whatever that is, the United States said, you know what, we're going to underwrite colonialism. We're going to maintain European control of the third world under our dominion. This became U.S. statecraft. They made a choice, communism or colonialism, as the bigger threat. And the U.S. said communism was the bigger threat. That became part of what U.S. statecraft was. So that what we're seeing today, the so-called Arab Spring and all these other groups, they're just a continuing struggle against forms of colonialism in one way or another, or the supporting of dictators in one way or another, or a Cold War dynamic in one way or another. Right? Third World never got free. Right? But it's also important for what it did domestically. Because to be enabled a communist domestically, the Smith Act said you were going to go to prison if you were a member of the Communist Party or you were associated with communism in one form or another. So it squelched and narrowed the range of dissent. You didn't want to speak out too critically about the United States. You might be labeled a communist and go to jail. And so what did that do to this black left that was so critical of the United States and the European powers and aligned themselves with the third world. What did it do? It split the black left. It split the black left. There was a wing that maintained their leftist politics, Paul Robeson, W.B. Du Bois, Claudia Jones, Lorraine Hansberry. Malcolm X emerges out of this. But the majority of this black left became the mainstream wing of what we now call civil rights. And they assumed a certain posture. They said, okay. Because the U.S. knew this. The U.S. knew. Sorry if somebody's recording. I'm kind of the logic was this. Okay, well, if the United States wants to curry favor with the third world, with the darker nation, so to speak. The majority of the world that was already suspicious of the West and whiteness, the United States wanted to curry favor 
with those countries and see the United States as a just arbiter against the Soviets. The United States would have to do something about its treatment of black people domestically. And so these, main, these organizations that became civil rights, they came to an understanding with the US government, with the state. And they said, OK, we will support your anti-communist battles abroad, because we're your Achilles heel. Penny Von Eschen and a whole host of scholars have talked about this. We're your Achilles heel. How you treat us is indicative of how the third world sees you. And if they see incidences of racial violence, if they see segregated schools, segregation and transportation, housing, and a whole host of other forms of inequality, they're not going to trust you. So you need to pass some legislation that's going to make you look democratic. Now, I'm not here to argue, because I think it's unfair to do so, that this wing of the black left that became civil rights sold out. What I'm trying to suggest to you, as, they, as the saying goes, is don't hate the player, hate the game. Black people were facing tremendous racial violence in this country. I mean, to this day they continue, but in a particular form at that time. Lynchings were sport. Segregation was in the books separate water fountains, intense, entrenched poverty. So black scholars, activists, organizers, they were looking for some form of legislative relief. Pass an anti-lynching law, for God's sake. Desegregate transportation, housing, education. Do something. Give us some relief. And so this understanding, this pact, so to speak, that got made, as Penny Von Eschen and others argue, right? in exchange for legislation bringing relief from racial violence, mainstream black organizations then supported US foreign policy and anti-communist politics. They said, we will, we will support your anti-communist crusade if you grant us these rights domestically. And as Penny Von Eschen and others have argued, and I talk about it in my book, this fractured the black left. The argument that Negroes are Americans too fractured the black left. And no longer did then the civil rights movement connect their struggles to those in the third world. They connected their destiny to U.S. empire. They connected their destiny to U.S. empire. And it's really important for people to think about this context of civil rights. This is what civil rights is today, right? I'm going to read you a couple quotes, right? Okay. So this is, you know, the U.S. For example, this is the Truman Commission on Civil Rights in 1946. Quote, throughout the Pacific, Latin America, Africa, the Near, Middle, and Far East, the people which our Negroes face is taken as a reflection of our attitudes toward all dark-skinned people and plays into the hands of communist propaganda. Right? Um, Adam Clayton Powell, famous kind of black congressman, says, quote, and this became important because then blackness got used as a way of rebranding the United States. And these black activists participated in this logic. They said, quote, this is Adam Clayton Powell, quote, one dark face from the U.S. is as of much value as millions of dollars in economic aid to the third world, end quote. Ralph Bunch, historic figure, right? He argued that in order to win over Africa and Asia, quote, the legend of America as a liberalizing, in world in for a liberalizing force in world affairs would and could be established because, quote, carefully chosen Negroes could prove more effective than whites, owing to their unique ability to gain more readily the confidence of the natives, end quote. Right? And so I go on talking about how the State Department and the U.S. government were deeply invested in placing black faces in the diplomatic corps abroad, but also in promoting a particular image of America, even domestically. 
So I talk about how, for example, the State Department, if you read Penny Von Eschen's work, Sasko Blows Up the World, how she, the State Department sponsored the jazz tours. So jazz musicians were being promoted by the State Department. Artists and writers were being sent around the world as a way of showing that America celebrates black people, black artistry, black, black intellect, etc. Again, we can think about that. We'll talk about today how the U.S. is doing that still with black folk, but especially with Muslims. State Department is sponsoring, sponsoring all kinds of outreach programs to send Muslims abroad, right? As a way of putting on a particular face. And of course, Obama becomes, think about how that image rebrands the United States to the rest of the world. But I say all this to you to say that this is what civil rights is. It's about, the logic of civil rights is about domesticating, as some have argued, domesticating blackness. Domesticating race within the context of the United States and not seeing its connections to the third world. And Malcolm was the most vocal and visible critic of this. In all of his travels, and all of his writings, and all of his speeches, he was saying, don't, he would go to Cairo, and he would tell the Organization of African States, don't be fooled by the United States.